Hello everyone, this is Wesley Campbell and we are here for another Conversions Podcast. And I'm thrilled to have with me today a very old friend by the name of Reed Grafke. Reed Grafke. I met Reed Grafke probably, whew, I don't know. I don't know when, it, probably the early 90s, 1990s. And I think we met uh, at um, Denver at the big vineyard conference back then. Sounds right. <laughs> so say hello, Reed. Greet the, greet the listeners. Hey, everybody. Glad to be with you today. Thank you, Wesley, for taking the time. Yeah, and you're from Texas. Well, yeah, I lived in Texas a long time, but I'm in Monument, Colorado these days. Okay, but you were, are you a Texan? No, I uh, originally born in Tennessee, grew up in Kansas City and Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. And I've kind of lived around the world a little bit since. So. You're, you were a world traveler. I remember your story, your testimony. Okay, so um, what we're going to talk today is uh, I've got a unique job because this is the Memorial Weekend that we just remembered the life and ministry of Paul Kane. Paul Kane was the last of the healing revivalists from the 40s, the 1940s, and there's a whole significance with him and Billy Graham, the billion soul harvest that Bob Jones saw, the stadiums that that, um, that uh, Paul Kane saw. And so what we're gonna do is Reed lived with Paul as his personal assistant for approximately 20 years. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, um, he was traveling with Paul. He knew Paul. Uh, everything uh, you know about Paul, uh, the stories, the eyewitness accounts. So what we're going to do is something real unique: is that I'm going to be interviewing Reed on the life of Paul Kane, and then we're going to ask Reed at the end to give comments, particularly on takeaways. Like, what do we, you know, what can we learn from this? How, how do we, how do we then live in light of what we've seen? So, <clears throat> Reed, let's uh, let's just start with Paul, um, and then we're going to work our way forward till when you meet him and how you met him and all that. So, mm -hmm. let's start with. Can you tell our listeners, you know, back as far as you can remember about his mother Anna Kane, grandmother, great grandmother, where they were, what year, mm -hmm. etc. Take it away. Sure. Uh, Paul was born in 1929, and. Uh, he was born into a family where his mother was a well-known prophetess. Uh, his grandmother was a prophetess and his great-grandmother was a prophetess. Uh, he was born into this matriarchal family uh, when his mom was 44 years old. Hold it. Okay, when she was 44. Yes. Now, before he was born, did you ever hear stories of what they were like as you know, seers of the day. And they were, what, sure. in Dallas? Yes, in the Dallas area and uh, surrounding small town. Uh, they were known, if they were, none of Paul's uh, mom, grandmother, great-grandmother that I'm aware of had a public ministry of any kind. Uh, they were the person, back, that was before cars, you have to remember. So transportation was horse and buggy. And wow. if somebody lost their horse and could, you know, that was the, like losing your car, they would come to them and ask to, for them to pray and tell them where their horse is. Just like First Samuel 9, yeah. when Samuel, <clears throat> when Saul loses mm -hmm. his donkeys, they look for three days for the donkeys. And then they say, the, the servant says, there's a prophet up ahead, a seer. Perhaps right. he'll tell us which way to go. Yes. Exactly like that. Yeah. Amazing. Another time there was a small town that they lived in outside of Dallas. And they, uh, Paul's mom and grandmother had a vision of a tornado wiping the town out. And they literally went door to door and knocked on every single door and told people to get out. And every everybody left the town uh, to the person and the tornado did come through and level the town. Just destroyed every building. Yeah, so just if you can imagine the credibility you would have to have for people to actually take you serious uh, when you make a proclamation like that. That's, wow. That, that gives you some sort of clue as to the credible <clears throat> women that they were. Did 
Paul's grandmother, was she alive when Paul was born? I, I believe she was, but I can't verify it. I don't have any way of verifying that information. So, Paul, uh, how old was, when was Anna Cain, Paul's mother, when was she born? <clears throat> she was born, I believe it was 1886. Wow. And, you know, you've got to think what life was like back then. It was a pretty rough, you know, wild, wild west environment. Hmm. And people carried guns down the streets and... You know, people had gunfights, and it was rough and tumble world that she grew up in. And she she was 44, and already had two kids living, uh, which were Paul's older sisters, when she got pregnant with Paul. Wow. Would she later on in life tell you stories of life and when mm -hmm. she grew up and her grandmother and all yeah. this? Oh yeah, she she lived to be 104, almost 105. And I had the privilege of caring for her the last five years of her life. And she died in my arms, um, the, you know, as a precious old lady. Wow. Uh, we, we called her Granny. Granny. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so... <coughs> so, Granny, or Mom, is, you know, she's, she's, a, she's got two children. She's married to a Jewish husband, did you say? Yes, he was a uh, uh, non-believe, non-Christ-following uh, Jewish man, and though he he would never, uh, he didn't come to Christ till Paul was right at eighteen in one of Paul's meetings. Uh, the miracle that he saw on the night that Paul was miraculously born and his mother healed, uh, he would fight you if you criticized that miracle. Mm. because he saw it but wow. yet he's even though he's, he he saw the supernatural miracle of Paul's birth he he still wouldn't surrender his life to Jesus and he never would go to one of Paul's meetings until Paul was about 18 just before he died yeah so he he finally did go to a meeting and when Paul finished preaching his dad was the first one to run all the way from the back to the front and Paul was so shocked he said dad what's the matter and he he said son there's two really big guys standing right behind you i think they're angels and i i just couldn't hardly wait for you to stop talking so i could surrender my life to jesus <laughs> so, wow that's paul told you that story yes <clears throat> wow that's and it, his, his mom did too so you know i heard so that he from, saw the angels behind paul yeah and was that a regular occurrence it sure seems like it was back in those days. Wow. Okay. So let's go now to Anna Kane, and uh, she's going to be pregnant. She's pregnant. When do her diseases in her body start? Before, like just around the time she's pregnant, or before? How? How? Mm -hmm. give me, give, tell us about that. Well, Anna was in her forties and getting sick. Her husband. Uh, was a little older actually in his 60s and so she got pregnant and I'm not sure wh what stage the diseases were when she got pregnant but during her pregnancy they progressed and to where the the tuberculosis in both of her lungs was severe enough that she had to be quarantined away from her other kids, away wow. from any visitors. Only her husband <clears throat> could go in the bedroom in her own home. So she got tuberculosis in both lungs. Yes. Now, if people don't know this, but if you, I remember a Time magazine and watching that there was 20 million people in North America died in the 20s from tuberculosis. Yeah. It was an epidemic. Yeah, the uh, polio and <clears throat> tuberculosis when Paul was born in 29, were still uncurable or incurable. And it was really formed the ground for the uh, healing revival to, to come on the scene because we had two diseases just ravaging our, our country. And millions of and, people dying from them. Yeah, and they were, uh, doctors would regularly in those days send people home to die and say there's nothing more we can do. So that created the vacuum into which these men and women with incredible healing gifts stepped into. And, uh, you know, when a person is that desperate, 
there's a faith that they're, they, they have that we just don't see today when they say, well, I'm going to get some prayer, and if it doesn't work, I'll just go back to the doctor. You know, that's a whole different mindset than I'm either going to die or God's going to heal me. Wow. Hmm. <clears throat> so she had tuberculosis. What else did she have? Uh, she had had a terminal heart disease that was growing worse, and she had uh, uh, malignant tumors, three malignant tumors in her womb, preventing the baby's birth, and cancer in both breasts. So four terminal diseases. Wow. And as she lay in bed, quarantined in her own home. But before that, so the doctor, the doctor took a great interest in her and wrote up all this material about her diseases and, you know, sent her home to die, but was really concerned for her. Now mm -hmm. tell us, okay, so she's crying out to God. She's in the state of near death. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, in, in her words, um, as she lay in bed, wasting away to, to skin and bones, literally miraculously surviving, the baby continued to grow until it was near time for him to be born. And she would say that it was the midnight hour when, the, and she would, when she said this, it would be through tears of joy and gratitude, even when she was 100 years old and would retell this story it would touch her deeply and she would say it was the midnight hour and the angel of the lord put his hand on me and said daughter be of good cheer you will live and not die the fruit of your womb is a male child naming paul and he will preach my gospel as the apostle paul of old and she was instantly healed uh, her husband paul's dad was in the room um, and would fight you if you made fun of it or denied it, it really happened. Um, it was just, it was one of those supernatural ministry uh, miracles, but also it was Paul's calling wow. uh, into <clears throat> ministry from even before his birth. Hmm. Now, um, I also heard them say later, the doctor who co covered her case called her a bona fide or one of the first bona fide miracles that he had ever seen mm -hmm. and including new tissue mm -hmm. in her lungs etc yes is that what you heard yes yes yeah. so so then she began to recover yes she uh, it was a virtually instantaneous healing but her body had a a long way to go to regenerate tissue and <clears throat> Uh, but the very fact that Paul was able to be born when there was were tumors blocking uh, the birth canal. Yes. So. so so now I always say this when I tell the story, uh, you know, daughter, you will live and not die. And I say, you will live and not die. Remember that phrase because, you know, 44, 54, 64, 74, 84, 94, 104 years old, that in itself is a sign and a wonder, is it not? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 60 more years. 60 years on from, from, from a situation of life of dying. Okay, so Paul gets born. They name him Paul. Did you ever hear of any supernatural events in his childhood? Well, uh, my understanding is he fully surrendered his life to Christ when he was right around five or six, and just fell in love with Jesus. And his mother really groomed him to be a seer, and she was afraid to discipline him for fear of touching God's anointed. Oh dear. That's how she would say it. So Paul, Paul grew up with a very strong mother. I believe his grandmother had some influence in his early years as well. And he grew up with two sisters in, in a house with a passive dad. Uh, by eight years old, so imagine coming to Christ at six. By eight years old, Paul's he, gift is beginning to work. Now, did, did, did I ever hear a story that he heard a voice that called him and his sister heard it too? Was that Paul? Yes, that's, that's exactly what okay, I remember. Tell me well. about that. Just, I just remember that <gasps> the Lord... Uh, called him by name in some in some manner when he was around six years old 
his sister heard the the same voice and you know these were small houses these were not mansions these were basically shacks um they paul did not grow up with money and his sister heard the same voice and said you know i want to i want to get in on this basically and uh but it was paul's time to come to christ and, wow and be it was really an invitation do you want to follow me and be the man i made you to be and he he said yes and by within a couple of years paul was his gift was beginning to function at uh, eight years old yes and he was starting to speak in churches uh, he by his own admission he didn't know what he was doing he didn't know if god showed him something uh, negative about a person he would blurt that out just as much as if god showed him he was going to heal a person and he would create havoc because he had, he had no training in uh, appro- <clears throat> what's appropriate in ministry and what's not. So. I heard some funny stories about things he blurted out. Did you remember some of those stories? Well, he had a tendency to to see sin in people's life and <laughs> would call that out. It, and it wasn't always a visitor. Sometimes it was one of the elders or something <laughs> like that. So it didn't go over real good. <clears throat> Uh, I heard every once case. that he was invited to one of the churches and they couldn't find the pastor because he was hiding under the piano. Yes, <laughs> there's, a, there's a few stories like that out there. <laughs> okay, so, so they take him. Now, do they, uh, do, they're taking him around. He's preaching. He's 8, 9, 10. He's yes. starting to see. Did, he, did they take him to hospitals? <clears throat> uh, not that I'm aware of. To the sick? Um, by 12 years old, Paul was starting to pray for the sick, and he was starting to, I think, develop some preaching skills, and uh, he was filling churches around the Dallas area when he was 12 years old. 12 years old. He was a boy prophet as, and kind of a novelty, you know, young preacher. Did uh, they call him the boy prophet? Uh, that, he, he was known as a boy prophet later in life, you wow. know, he, in his teenage years, but... I'm not sure when that uh, when that name was coined. So okay, so he's he's in his teens. Tell me what you can remember about his ministry in his teenage years. Well, I know that um, by his late teens, that uh, a wealthy uh, promoter manager had come alongside of him and started getting Paul into larger and larger meetings, arenas, churches, uh, tent meetings, the the various modes of a ministry back in the day. And Paul, somewhere in his late teens, was beginning to work with the generals of the faith, the William Branhams, the A.A. Uh, a. Allens. Uh, gosh, I haven't thought of these names in so long. The... P.L. Osborne type men and women. Uh, there was a hundred of them. There was a hundred of them emerging right. in this period of uh, forty-five to forty-eight. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> forty-five yes. to forty-eight. So Paul was born in nineteen twenty-nine. So uh, twenty-nine, thirty-nine. Yeah, I mean, he would have been a teenager when they were just exploding on the scene. There were. Right. It was like a rocket ship of all these guys. Right, and they uh, in the early stages they all worked together well. I mean, they they were excited. It was a new thing. It was revival was coming to our nation. Uh, diseases were being healed that were incurable, just right and left. It was as if God dumped a hundred anointed vessels on the scene all at once, and they just spread across the country. Uh, it, it became known as the healing revival because there was multiple multiple salvations and uh, a lot of evangelism happened uh paul was known as a boy prophet but also as a healing evangelist so the gift of healing was prominent but it was uh part of the function of the gift was to attract people to the gospel and so just imagine you know largest tents in the world at the time these guys and gals were traveling around doing one meeting after another. The meetings would typically go one to two weeks. 
and healing every night, um, literally truckloads of wheelchairs and crutches would be carried away every day from these meetings. Uh, if you look at some of the old records and pictures, magazines from that era, uh, it just it's mind boggling. It is to see the stacks and piles of crutches and handicap devices. Wow, like Amy Simple McPherson, Los Angeles Temple, and that. And I mean, I just want to interject. <clears throat> you know, there are many books out there, Generals of the Faith by Roberts Laird and others, but uh, William Branham, there's a set which we call the Blue Books. It was five and six of the Blue Books, and I read this, uh, you know, literally amazing. Now, William Branham did get off in certain teachings and doctrines that he believed and carried but that was his weak suit, and everybody said it, uh, that you know he wasn't a theologian, but what he was was a, 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 a sovereign vessel, a prophetic revivalist, mm-hmm. healing evangelist. And when he would function in that gift, I mean, literally, uh, it, it, those books describe, in my reading, it would be like more miracles than even Jesus did in his ministry mm-hmm. in three years. It was, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. And there were such starting, there were resurrections from the dead, blind, <clears throat> deaf, dumb, every mm-hmm. conceivable thing. And my understanding was that he would actually have Paul take his place at certain meetings when he felt that he wasn't supposed to go because mm-hmm. Paul carried such a similar anointing. Yeah, I think they had a bit of a father-son relationship, um, and they worked together uh, fairly regularly. Wow. So I want to encourage you to look up those books of William Branham, The Life of William Branham. The early one is really, uh, you know, it's cute. His first, the first book describes his life and his boyhood, and that, but by about the middle of book three and book four, I mean, you'll be weeping at the miracles that were uh, taking place in that era. Hmm. And Paul was a part of that whole ethos. Right. Okay, so... The, um, the, the thing that, that I think has to be said here is that um, Paul and William Branham had a similar issue in that Paul uh, had a promoter that managed his ministry, his finances, and really organized things to help help gain Paul just greater and greater influence. William Branham had a similar man in his ministry, and this man was more of a theologian uh, and always was trying to polish William Branham's style into something maybe a bit more (coughs) respectable or whatever. Uh, Prior to this man, William Branham was a humble, uh, prophetic man that had been a game warden prior to having his supernatural encounters with Jesus and being called into ministry. And by all accounts, his messages were simple, straightforward uh, messages geared towards getting people healed and delivered. Hmm. So on the scene for William Branham comes a man who begins to write his sermons and uh, influence his teachings, um, and uh, it, to me, had a very negative impact on the simplicity of who he was. Uh, Paul's manager had a similar uh, impact on Paul, not writing his sermons or dictating uh, what he said or what he believed, but but by just constantly promoting him, constantly driving him into way too many meetings that precluded Paul from having quality time with the Lord and um, staying in the place of his humble beginnings where everything flowed out of God's presence and mm-hmm. his relationship with Jesus. So I think that happened with a lot of good men and women that were leading the charge in that revival. Is They just didn't have a lot of wisdom in the kind of people they let into their inner circle. And you said that Paul then, you know, his organization grew very, very big. Yes, he had, Paul at one time had houses in seven, seven different locations and different states and, you know, fancy cars in each one, semi-trucks to carry the tin around. He, 
I think he would jokingly say I had the largest tent in the world for about a month because I bought it off the guy that had it. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I was able to buy it from him was because he bought a bigger one. (laughs) Wow. So was it during this time or just before this time that he received the call to not marry, but rather to live a life of singleness? Um, this, you know, I may disagree with some people on my view of this, but, um, I don't think Paul had a call to celibacy. Mm -hmm. I think he chose to be celibate because, um, he had several close calls in marriage. He was engaged several times. And I think when it came right down to it, he just was unwilling to give up being Lord of his own life being in control and I think had he married uh, it would have enabled God to get to some of those areas Mm. that would have enabled Paul to actually uh, become a much stronger voice and a a much better man towards the end of his life Mm -hmm. you know I think you may understand as I do that you know God grows a man as far as he can and then he has he marry a woman to help him grow up the yeah, rest of the way? Because it's, it's not good for a man to be alone. <laughs> yeah. I just heard Lisa there. Revere speak at uh, Bethel, and she said, "God says it's not good for a man to be alone." He said, "She said, ladies, go get those men." <clears throat> and she's a feisty uh, Sicilian yeah. grandma, and she's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, but there was a t- uh, that that vision that he had when Jesus appeared in his car in Santa Maria. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, we're, it's odd that we're in Santa Maria right now. Mm. And uh, Paul was somewhere back in his late 20s. Uh, he was driving up the West Coast here, up uh, 101 through Santa Maria. And it was middle of the night, two or three in the morning. And he notices there's flashing red lights in the rear view mirror. And so he pulls over and the policeman comes up to his car and and Paul rolls his window down, but the policeman is shining his light in the rear back seat and the floorboards and, and, and the light starts kind of shaking because there's nobody there except Paul. And, and the policeman says, where is he? And Paul said, where's who? And he said, the other guy that was with you. And he, Paul said, well, sir, that was the Lord. And now the light's really shaking, and the, uh, the police officer says, well, uh, do you understand that you and the Lord just ran through three red lights in downtown Santa Maria? And Paul <laughs> said, no, sir, I'm a little bit tired, and uh, I guess I wasn't paying attention. And the officer, the light's shaking even more. He says, well, I'll tell you what, if you and the Lord will get a hotel... I'd like to try to forget that this ever happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> so but, and the, the Lord was just in the car speaking with Paul, I think, about a deeper consecration. Right. And I think Paul's takeaway on that, that that was maybe a call to live a more celibate life. Whether that was the right takeaway or not, nobody knows. So. But he did have an encounter, yeah. and the policeman was shaking enough to verify it. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So, um, th- uh, as a result of this, uh, you know, explosion, and you know, you could prob- there's probably miracles that we could read about, but Paul began to shy away from the large stages, and he actually felt that he had, you know, stepped over the line. That it was too, it was too popular, it was too gaudy, it was too, you know, too much money, too much everything, and he withdrew. Is that correct? Well, he. He burned out, basically. Uh, he, he, by his mid to late twenties, uh, he was caught up in the fame and fortune of that movement, as were so many others. And his peers were dropping like flies, falling into sin, or uh, having to leave the ministry for, you know, financial reasons, uh, uh, alcoholism. I mean, you name it. There was. Uh, just Paul's peers were just leaving the stage. And Paul Paul was growing more and more disillusioned. Uh, he was suffering physical, mental, emotional burnout. And 
the d- disillusionment grew to the point that he, he just couldn't bear it anymore. And somewhere in his late 20s, he literally disappeared from the face of the healing movement. And mm-hmm. you, you see a sudden, you, prior to that, you can see the articles written about him in various publications, and then all of a sudden, he's not on the scene anymore. Wow. And by that time, there wasn't a whole lot of other folks that were once prominent names on the scene as, as well. So it was, uh, it was a decline of the movement. Wow. Hmm. And then um, what happened next? Like, okay, what, 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 what does he do in those years? Well, I came along right at the end of his kind of uh, what he would call hidden years. Um, and I met a lot of people that were healed during those 25 to 30 years that he was in relative obscurity. Um, I met people that knew him well, business people, church people that were his friends that had been walking with him for, you know, 15, 20 of those years. And I kind of learned a, about his life. He probably didn't preach more than, I would say, 10 or 12 times a year. So maybe once a month he would take a meeting somewhere. Wow. Um, and it would typically be in a church not or a full gospel businessmen's meeting, not a prominent stage. And the, the <coughs> one thing that was consistent during those years is that there was just a lot of healing there was just a really pure flow of uh prophetic uh paul tended to you know not pray for people to be healed but pronounce them healed and the uh so i met uh people that were delivered from mental institutions you met them yes and i i I could tell you their story in detail uh, people that were supernaturally healed in the hospital or when Paul came to their home. So he did a, a lot of personal ministry, but he kept his public ministry at a minimum. Hmm. I think really just enough to keep food on the table. And wow. uh, he didn't have, he, he had lost all ambition to build a large organization. And did you say that his mother was prominent in, was it that time or when would she? be his chief intercessor and say, okay, the man over here in the, in the yeah. plaid blazer who's in a wheelchair or this man over here, mm-hmm. when was that? Or was that all through his life? That was his whole life. She, she, Paul and his mom had a, a, a bond between them that he could be 2,000 miles away and she could call him up and say, son, don't forget to pray for the lady in the wheelchair on, in the red dress. This is her night to be healed. And wow. she, she just, she just was tuned in to Paul so clearly knew how to pray for him. And I, I know this not from stories from those almost silent years, but I know it from, she traveled with us when I started working with Paul for years and I saw it firsthand. If it, if you were in a meeting for one to two weeks, uh, and there would be one or two particular nights where the Holy Spirit was just going to fall and heal a lot of people. Uh, when you prayed with her that particular night, she would always start speaking in tongues and go into the Spirit and start prophesying and telling Paul several things to look for uh, for people that were going to be healed. So she would see it before it happened, pro- prophesy it in the back prayer meeting, Paul would preach and then watch for the situation unfold, mm-hmm. and he would decree it, just declare it. Yeah. Now you watch this with your eyes. M- many times. <clears throat> that was that was the way that they worked together. Wow. Yeah. So she was she was, by all accounts, she was like a mom, but also like a wife in the sense that she she and Paul had that intimate bond uh, where they could finished sentences, knew each other's thoughts, and, wow. you know, they've just been close for many years. Amazing. And how many miracles did you witness? I don't know. I never counted. I mean, but you know, if you were just... The, say- the first time I saw Paul, I was, uh, you know, like a 19, 20-year-old young businessman, and uh, Paul was uh, at a full gospel businessman meeting. He was probably right at 50 years old. And uh, 
the uh, I'm sitting in the audience towards the back, and uh, it's the ministry time. Paul's already preached, and he calls out the man sitting right next to me, and he tells him. How did him, he call him up? He he just pointed. He's you there, dressed in such and such, with the bald head. You know, uh, this is your night to be healed. Um, God just is healing you of uh, debilitating gout right now in the name of Jesus. Debilitating gout. Yeah. Well, what was interesting is that was my (laughs) father-in-law. So that was my introduction to Paul's prophetic healing ministry. Uh, My father-in-law was instantly healed and uh, stayed healed after that as well. And the... uh, it was uh, my introduction, and, and something in my heart resonated with the prophetic that was flowing through Paul. And I just started asking the Lord, you know, Lord, I want to learn this. I want to understand this, and I'd really like to meet Paul. And through mutual friends, I found a way to meet him uh, in a very short time after that. Uh, I helped him convert a part of his home into an office, and and um, started serving his family and his ministry. Uh, meanwhile, my career is taking off, and I ultimately end up going to England for a year to work and uh, feel called to ministry while over there. And, you know, back in those days, there was no such thing as business as mission or anointed for business. I mean, if you felt any kind of a calling, all the advice you would get is leave your business world. Leave your nets. Yeah, and go, yeah, leave your nets behind and, <clears throat> and lay down your life to, to become a minister of the gospel. And so I uh, came back uh, uh, to the United States from England in December of 79. And uh, two friends of mine that owned, Christ- owned their own companies, Christian businessmen, offered me jobs. And one in particular said, you can travel and help Paul as much as you want. Just I, We just need you to do this work when you're in town. So I went to work with them uh, for the first year and uh, was able to travel with Paul about three months that year. And that was when he was just starting to come out of those almost silent years, uh, the hidden years, and take, take more and more meetings. Um, you know, he'd like to take his mom with him, and uh, it was... She was a riot to be around because she, you know, she just was very, very uh, prophetic and, you know, wow. she Seven was a nine. seer, <clears throat> feeler. Yeah, so, and she was already, you know, in her 90s at the time, but still vibrant. Uh, so she, she was traveling the world, vibrant in her 90s, doing nightly meetings, night after night after night with Paul. Yeah, yeah he uh, <clears throat> he had a motor home and you know practically had a bed in there that she could lay down or sit up in and so she was comfortable and and uh she just loved to pray for that man you know she she lived vicariously through him Hmm. uh i mean he she loved him to pieces and when you I, i mean i saw startling words of knowledge uh can you describe a few that you saw that just like blew your mind well, you know, some of the most amazing things are were when we would get to a meeting. You know how you're we are wiped out and you got nothing uh, physically. You're just depleted, but you, the show must go on. So you get up there, and Paul, you know, walks into let's say a John Wimber meeting in Australia with you know 5,000 people and he's just got off the plane and and he does his best to preach a coherent sermon and and then he you know kind of fumbles through that because he's so tired and well then he'll point up to the balcony and he'll say sir you uh, have a particular person stand and tell them what's wrong with them uh, what they did you know that afternoon what they were what they were doing and uh and then the pronou- conversation they had with somebody. Yeah, and then pronounce them healed, and the uh, and then the next night they come down and say I was healed and I was that 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 did have that conversation and so that was that was regular, but it 
it, in truth, it wasn't as regular as you might think. Uh, I think, you know, it's so, I think one of the things that prophetic people do that hurts them, that hurts their own ministries, is that they portray that these things happen everywhere they go. Mm-hmm. Every single time they get up to preach that great signs and wonders follow. And they leave us thinking that by telling us the great stories that happened somewhere else. And the truth is, when those things happen, it's awesome. I mean, it's, and you feel it. You don't just see it or hear it. You feel, feel it. in the room. Yeah. Um, but sometimes, you know, it does, those kind of things don't happen. Sometimes you're in the trenches down praying for people for hours to see just a little bit of fruit. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's so easy you just speak the word and and miracles begin to happen and i i mean if i have a wish for young prophets uh, a hope it's that they will represent themselves accurately Mm. and not allow their reputations to be built on the mountain peaks of their life but on the parts of the iceberg that's below the surface Um, i think when we're authentic about how we represent the way god uses us that it creates a much deeper power that we carry because the power is flowing out of our character, not just out of our gifting. Right. And that's, that's my desire for this generation of young prophets that will learn the lesson from the older prophets like Paul that had men around them their whole life that just constantly promoted them as the prophet that never misses it, the prophet that always sees miracles everywhere he goes. And, and while... There's times that that's true and that you couldn't overstate it because God was so powerfully moving through them. There's also times where they're just just a man, you mm-hmm. know, and they they can't make stuff happen. And so I, I think it just honors God when we accurately represent our abilities. Wow, that's so true. That's so true, Reed. You know, we're going to kind of move to close here pretty soon but um <clears throat> so through the 80s the the 80s uh paul got linked up with mike bickle amazing that's a huge story mike might mike might uh, bring that in on the prophetic history now uh, this uh 2019 is the 20 year history in september and uh he he told a 40 minute story to 600 staff last week and blew their minds because when paul came first to mike to mike bickle's church in uh, Grandview, he saw the banner, Joel's Army in Training, which was, he began to have reoccurring visions um, of, of stadium revivals, the sick. Uh, we have a, a, one of it on a recording on our Prayers to the Harvest, and you can also see and hear this on the, um, on the YouTube memorial. We've got a clip of that, but he saw a time when stadiums would be filled with people coming to God. And he began to speak this to John Wimber and others. They, they traveled, Mike said they traveled to, <clears throat> I think it was 1990, they traveled to England and they did uh, the UK, five cities, 50,000 people audience. And uh, it was the time of the Kansas City prophets and it was uh, amazing. So he had all these <clears throat> visions that he had in the silent years that he was bringing forward. Now what he was seeing for the times and um, I know part, part of that, if you remember, he, he said the, that the folks leading these stadium meetings were nameless and faceless. Mm. And that's a significant part. And, and that, I think, partly a reaction to the fact that those that led in the early days of the healing revival were the huge personalities the the larger than life leaders of that era and the uh and it caused some arrogance to get into the movement which is like poison in the dough as bob jones used to say and the uh so what paul's heart coming out of that uh disillusionment time was to see uh large-scale revival and uh, that would spill from small arenas and churches into bigger and bigger arenas and all into the biggest stadiums of the world. But the most significant part of it 
is he saw that the leaders that were being the most mightily used of God were ordinary people. Hmm. They weren't the generals of the faith. And so if we believe in his vision of stadiums being filled with people coming to Christ and uh, wholesale healings and things, uh, we have to also stop and say, what would it take right now for everyday people uh, that are living for God wow. to actually step into that kind of authority? And I, I think it all comes down to fathering, Wes, to discipling a generation to move in God's power with dignity and humility. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, but it's power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's there's not a lot of people that can handle uh, the power of God without it uh affecting their own humility and so however if it's not just happening to one or two but god's pouring out his spirit on all flesh and sons and daughters are prophesying and old men are dreaming dreams and young men are seeing vision and uh from my servants and handmaidens i'll pour out my spirit in those days if we're seeing that yeah um there's a self, self-regulating self humility that happens when God's Spirit is poured out on a group of people. Um, no one wants to be the arrogant guy that talks too much or that has to be in the center stage all the time. Those kind of guys kind of get weeded out in the presence of the greatness of outpouring on a group of people mm. where you, you would be hard-pressed to point to who was leading the meeting because there were so many people God was using powerfully. Wow. And that, that was Paul's, that was the heart behind his whole stadium vision. So, which, is, which is so encouraging for people today because, you know, Stacy and I having done this for 30 years, you know, meetings on the road for 30 years, it, it takes a whole infrastructure to do that. Whereas there's an invitation coming to people who have regular jobs and they're serving God in, yeah. in, in the marketplace, but they're anointed and gifted and something's gonna happen and it's gonna be spontaneous and they're gonna be used and you don't have to necessarily, you know, leave your nets and become, as it were, not a professional, but a, you know, as your complete job, God's gonna invite everybody into this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's the concept of, of the scriptures that we have the treasure in earthen vessels. Hmm. I mean, we're just all an earthen vessel, and God just invests His treasure in us <clears throat> that the excellence of the power may be of Him, and not of us. And uh, you know, for us to make make it appear that God has entrusted His power to just me or just a handful of uh, others like me is, you know, preposterous. Yeah, I think preposterous. It, yeah, good word. So uh, almost, I know you've got to catch an airplane soon. So, you know, to kind of bring this thing around, um, it was just last year when, uh, oh, let, uh, it was just last year when Lou Engel was, it was 2018, and he was uh, praying and fasting. He was going to do a 40 days of fasting. And he was in, you know, for this, the whole, the send, moving from the call to the send. And uh, yeah. So Lou was praying and he was in this time of fasting and he came to 2 Kings 2.12 and he was just gripped with Elijah and Elisha. And that's the story where Elijah was going to go to heaven and he was going to be taken and Elisha was asking for the double portion, the double portion of his mantle. And... Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. I, it's not, you know, I can't just give this to you. He says, but if you see me when I'm taken, if you see me, then you will have the, what you ask. And 2.12 was the actual verse where Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind and the chariots of heaven. And as Lou was praying this, he was gripped <clears throat> with an old word by Bob, by Bob Jones that uh, when Billy Graham goes, 
his mantle would be, as it were, multiplied and dispersed throughout the world for the great harvest. And Bob used to say, uh, Reed, he used to say, the reason Billy Graham is, is around so long is because we're not ready, we're not ready. So Lou Engel began to can just pray on 2-12, February 12th, it was 2-12, last year. And then they had a dream, and one of the dream was, uh, 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 the man in the dream had to tighten his belt 10 more notches, and it was 10 more days of fasting. And Lou began to do the math, and he just says, I need to go to Santa Maria, to the home of Paul Cain, and we have to have a 10-day prayer strike, and we're gonna call on God to release this end time declaration uh, that Paul carried ever since his, the passing of his mother, and I'll come to that in just a moment. So Lou set up the meetings and we organized it here at the Santa Maria Healing Rooms, and uh, it was to culminate on April 18th, which was 418. Now, Reed, I didn't know about this prophecy, but Lou had heard about it. You end this story with, okay, what was the Luke 418 prophecy that was given to Paul that was for him and for the worldwide church and the end time harvest? Well, Paul, Paul's mother died on uh, 418, 1990 at 418 in the afternoon. And Paul felt like she had given him uh, Luke 4.18 as uh, a sign word that he was waiting for his whole life. And the uh, that's, you know, in his own words, that's what he said happened. Uh, I was there at the uh, her passing and tried to resuscitate her along with uh, one of our other dear friends. And so it was... Uh, you know, the transitional moment in Paul's life, it really was hard for him to let her go at 104, nearly 105. Wow. And it took him a fair good while to actually get over losing his mom. Uh, it left a gaping hole in, in his heart. And But he, uh, I just don't think he's ever gotten away from that, uh, that word. Mm -hmm. And Mike was with us yesterday, and he said, Mike Bickle, he said, Paul knew that his mother had a word for him and that he was looking for it and praying for it and that it was gonna be given. And so obviously I would say that she didn't know what the word was or she would have given it earlier, <clears throat> yeah. but it was on the last day of her life mm -hmm. uh, as she's drifting, you know, as it were, into the super, into the heavenly, into the eternal. You know, Mike said he saw Paul bend down to her ear and she spoke it. And it really was Luke 4, 18, which is the words that Jesus quoted when he began his ministry in Nazareth. Uh, I was in a little, like a replica of a synagogue there in Nazareth just a few months ago. And you know, the feeling of it, and he took the scroll, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news of the gospel. He's anointed me to proclaim freedom <clears throat> to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind. I mean, it was just, you know, acceptable year. and the acceptable year of the Lord. And, you know, what Paul released on 418 in Santa Maria and it's on video was really just the prayer that the this church of this of this hour, this this end time church would be released in this power of Luke 418 that we will see the stadium is filled that we will see the billion soul harvest, that the things that have been prophesied and seen as visions for decades and decades is really upon us. And you know, 2020 is gonna be an amazing year. Uh, who would have thought we would have got 2020? We're in the 20s. And um, <clears throat> so this is the time. And uh, you know, we've just experienced this weekend uh, as a memorial, an 89 year old prophet. His mother was 104. Uh, there's a continuum of just God's working. And Reed, I'm, uh, I was so excited. Your, your message was also recorded uh, the, the couple days before the memorial. It's on the Healing Rooms uh, site, Reed Grafke. Reed is R-E-E-D, beautiful message. And you spoke for an hour and a half about God's call on us now and uh, uh, the personal, takeaways. Personal <clears throat> revival. Personal revival, it was amazing. Yeah. And so I wanna just say thank you so much for coming. 
And uh, why don't you pray for the listeners and pray this, uh, you know, what you carry from your years of experience. Well, Father, I thank you for Wesley, Stacy, and their love for you and their love for revival. And Lord, thanks for allowing me to uh, just add my voice to theirs. Lord, I just uh, take hold of Wesley's hand mm. right now. And we just come into agreement that you will raise up a generation yes. of men and women and boys and girls, God, that can carry your power uh, to our generation with purity, with anointing, uh, with dignity, and, and we would be able to honor those that have gone before us. As, as Job 29 says, that the Job experienced that the perish, the blessing of a perishing man yeah. would come upon him. Yeah. And Lord, those that are, are perishing and have gone before us do leave a blessing behind. And whether we call it a mantle or whatever we call it, a residual anointing, uh, whatever we call it, it is an assignment and the authority to complete it. So Lord, uh, I ask that you would just pour your spirit out upon this generation, yeah. upon those that hear this message today, and that you would begin to raise up ordinary men and women yeah. who can walk in the glorious power of God. Lord, you, you said in your word that your kingdom does not consist in words, but in power. Lord, in demonstration and in much assurance. So, Lord, you told us also that many will say in that day, Jesus is over here and Jesus is over there and, and try to get us to go running after revival somewhere in the world. But you said the kingdom of God is within, yeah, us. within us. And Lord, we don't have to go far to <coughs> see revival. We just have to draw near to you mm. and let it explode on the inside of mm. us. And Lord, uh, you, you told us to count the cost, whether we have sufficient to finish mm. what we start. And Lord, um, I don't think that what you're asking from any of us to walk in God's power is too great. I just see it as you're not trying to take something from us, but you're trying to give us something as a generation that has so much mass that it will push other things out of our life. Right. And un unless we're willing to let those things be displaced, that we probably will never be the ones that you use to perform your greatest miracles. Mm. So God, I just would ask that for myself, God, that I would know how to align my heart with you mm. in such a way that the wine skin of my heart is ready mm. as your new wine begins to pour out, as your healing power and grace and anointing begin to come upon me, that the wide skin of my heart will have been conditioned and prepared and uh, to, to carry this to my generation. I ask that for everybody listening yeah. today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much, Reed. That was amazing. Uh, you, you're a... You're a <clears throat> living concordance of all these truths. Oh, and yeah, I just want to say one last thing. Um, you know, before we pray, um, I remember at the memorial, uh, James Gall got up and he said, except a kernel of wheat is planted, falls into the ground and, and dies, it abides alone. And he was just reflecting. He said, it's so startling that of the Kansas City prophets, the group of them, Bob Jones, uh, went to be to his coronation in, well, he had a dream actually uh, on uh, <clears throat> February 13th, which was the night Bob, uh, Paul Kane died. And he had a dream and you can watch it on the memorial, but he talked about seeing heaven and he saw Bob Jones and he saw John Paul Jackson, and he saw Oral Roberts, and he saw, you know, Jill Austin, and he saw all these onesies that had gone on before, and they were dancing, and, re and there was a reception, as it were, and there were thrones set, and uh, as he came out of the dream in the morning, um, <clears throat> he said, Lord, what is this? And the Lord spoke to him and said, uh, heaven is receiving a king, and um, sure enough, within, uh, within minutes after he woke, he received a text from a friend of his to say that Paul Kane had just passed 
that evening before, and he didn't know this. And so uh, he brought up to the to the uh, our understanding. He said Bob Jones was planted in the ground on two 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 February twenty second two thousand fourteen. Uh, John Paul Jackson was planted in the ground on 2-2-2, 2015. And unbelievably, Paul Kane, his burial was 2-2-2, 2019. And what was so incredible <clears throat> that I thought of before I heard that was that the very next day was the Citrus Bowl gathering, the Send, the first of its kind, where Lou Engel and many, many others, Andy Bird and all the young revivalists, the next generation, they led it. They didn't, it wasn't someone else. It was the next generation. And there was 50,000 revivalists, people calling out for global revival in the stadium to commission and be commissioned to, you know, walk in this very vision. So the day after Paul is planted really is the commencement of this vision. So that's amazing. So read. Uh, let's just pray, and God bless you all. I saw that all of the great stadiums and all of the football fields and auditoriums all over the country were just filled with people seeking God. And it seemed as though in this one place I was allowed to be an observer. There were men like we see here tonight, people like we see just all over this giant platform. And they had stretchers, hospital gurneys, and they had um, uh, cots and with bodies on them. People were sick, they had invalids. I tell you, the invalid section wasn't back in some old tent adjacent to the big tent where nobody could see them like in the old days but they were all out there before the people. All of these people are walking around and over the loudspeaker comes words like this and I heard it just as clear as I'm hearing my voice now and much clearer. We have a resurrection. We have a resurrection. This man was in the county hospital and he was pronounced dead this morning at 11 o'clock. We have a resurrection. He's come back to life. And then you just see people rejoicing magnifying God and it was just like a heavenly symphony everybody was just all making the most beautiful harmonious worship and then another uh, declaration we have a resurrection over here and this person had been dead and they rose from the dead and then cripples and uh, paralytics would be healed and step out of wheelchairs and people rather than going wild and giving some you know great ovation their voices would just come up as a great orchestration. I remember I would just seemingly uh, know that God had a string ensemble. He had a, uh, a brass section. He had all the full piece orchestra and the voices of these people. And it was a beautiful symphony. It was a beautiful symphony of life, thrilling me to life. And so as uh, they were worshiping, then that would die down. And then other paralytics would get up and walk and other signs and wonders would occur before the vast uh, multitudes there. And this would be going on all over the world. And then I found myself in front of a television set. And when I turned the dial on, the very first thing I began to hear was a news anchor man saying, and this would be on ABC, CBS, and NBC, and CNN, all of the major networks, I believe, will carry a story like this one day. And they were saying, ladies and gentlemen, the news anchorman, ladies and gentlemen, we have no news to report tonight. Only good news, seemingly. We just have good news tonight. And there are no sporting events to announce because all of the sports fields and all of the coliseums are filled with multitudes of people. And uh, you'll never believe what's happening. Uh, perhaps you will, but uh, uh, there are resurrections from the dead. Paralytics are walking out of the wheelchairs and dropping special devices and, and there's all kinds of healings and miracles and uh, it seems as though they're falling on their face in these stadiums. They're falling on their face and worshiping God. They're singing all these courses and, and uh, 
Uh, folks, we don't know who these people are. They're almost faceless people. And I, I tell you, that is really thrilling because God is going to have a people that will be so much like Jesus, you can't see them for the presence. And the presence of God is there. So it says, it seems like the whole world is falling on their faces saying, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And it's here, there, and everywhere. All stadiums are filled around the world seemingly. And the world is turning to God. Listen, friends, the church is going to become that first line of defense again. You hold that and remember. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Conversions on the Shiloh Global Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to help us continue to make these great programs, we encourage you to donate at our website, wesleystacycampbell.com. Also, check out Stacy Campbell's Shiloh Company Prophetic Mentorship, where you too can be mentored in the prophetic by Stacy herself. Download our free Shiloh Global app, available on the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. On the app, you can hear more programs not listed on the Charisma Podcast Network. Finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes, the Charisma Podcast Network, or wherever you listen to podcasts.